गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन थैंक यू डॉक्टर विश्वेश एंड यशोदा ग्रुप ऑफ हॉस्पिटल्स फॉर द इन्विटेशन इट्स ऑलवेज गुड टू टीच बेसिक्स टू स्टूडेंट्स एंड इवन टू द पीपल हु आर इन प्रैक्टिस फॉर लॉट ऑफ ईयर्स बिकॉज बेसिक्स इज समथिंग विच शुड स्टिक टू अस टिल द एंड ऑफ आर कैरियर्स मैनी ऑफ द पेशेंट्स आर ट्रीटेड जस्ट बाय द बेसिक मेडिसिन और वेन एवर वी आर कन्फ्यूज वी ऑलवेज गो बैक टू द बेसिक्स एंड ट्राई टू सॉल्व द केस सो वील बी स्टार्टिंग विद द टॉक इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ ए बी जी एंड पी एफ टी सो ऑन राउंड दिस रिपोर्ट यू ऑल मस्ट हैव सीन इन योर लाइफ सम और द अदर टाइम इट्स अ बिग रिपोर्ट कम्स विद अबाउट ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फाइव वेरिएबल्स बट वेन यू इंटरप्रेटेड यू फाइंड ओनली टू और थ्री वेरिएबल्स विच आर ऑफ योर इंटरेस्ट बट एवरीथिंग इन दिस रिपोर्ट इज ऑफ इंटरेस्ट फॉर द डायग्नोजिंग द पेशेंट वी वर ब्लेस टू बी टॉट बाय प्रोफेसर जे सी सूरी सर how to even diagnose and even given a clinical diagnosis just by a history and then abg we don't need an x-ray or a ct also at that time we were trained that well so whenever you see the abg after this talk always take a pen and paper in hand do not try to solve the abg without taking a pen and paper it will actually change your practice and it will develop an interest in the reading an abg and interpreting it so it is mostly viewed by complicated exercise by the most learners whenever they start uh, the reading the abg they see 20 variables and they get confused which one should i follow and a step by step guide involves the clinical history always have your clinical history first before interpreting the abg and it not uh, un only unravels the disease it tells you about the response to treatment also so uh, abg basics are divided into three parts uh, you have an acid base balance uh, which is cal uh, calculated by henderson hasselbalch equation by ph pco2 and bicarbonate then you have a ventilation part of the abg which in which you use a pco2 value and then you have oxygenation values uh, which is alveolar gas equation which is again calculated by pco2 po2 and oxygen saturation so among the four uh, parameters uh, your basics of abg and uh, step wise approach to acid based disorders again any approach begins with history uh clinical history is very important a patient with known diagnosis of obstructive airway disease he have a co2 leading to respiratory acidosis a patient with fever or pain may be hyperventilating and be in respiratory alkalosis knowing about the chronic uh, condition of the patient like diabetes hypertension any kidney disorder from previously liver disorder heart disorder because these affect your interpretation of abg parameters examination findings is my patient in shock is my patient in altered sensorium what is the respiratory pattern of my patient what is respiratory rot any signs of fluid overload like pedal edema raised jvp this also helps you in 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 evaluating abg to find the underlying etiology then any history of drug intake alcohol abuse any history of vomiting any history of diarrhea this will also help you in assessing the abg hence in diagnosis the entire uh, talk uh, or entire spectrum of reading an abg is to reach a diagnosis so step 2 involves the validity whether the abg which i have is valid or not if the abg is not valid there is no point in interpreting it so uh, when the abg is uh, about validity we use this chart you can just have it in your phone you can just have it pasted in your icu so whenever you just get an abg you check with the ph and h plus calculated with the pco2 in bicarbonate if they are within the range your abg is valid and then you move to step 3 then the evaluation begins with ph what is the ph if it is less than 7.36 we call it acidemia if it is uh, more than 7.44 we call it alkalemia however a ph in a normal range does not guarantee that patient has normal acid base balance a calculation of an ion gap must always be done before concluding that metabolic status is normal so uh, practically you have to go through all the steps b whatever be, uh, be the ph in your abg then we see what are the uh, disorders disorders are of two type respiratory disorders and metabolic disorders again respiratory disorders are acute and chronic metabolic disorders are acute so if there is acidemia say ph is less than 7.36 and bicarbonate is in same direction that is bicarbonate has fallen ph has fallen it is a metabolic disorder if your co2 is in opposite direction your ph is falling your co2 is rising it is a respiratory disorder when your ph is alkalemic range and if your uh, bicarbonate is again in same direction as ph that is ph has increased bicarbonate has increased it's a primary metabolic disorder and if your co2 has fallen and your ph has increased it's a respiratory disorder so changes in co2 does not always mean that your primary culprit is the respiratory system primary disorder is always determined by the ph 
be as in acidemia, then the component respiratory or metabolic, at times you see the combination of both the components is there. So after evaluating your validity, you evaluate the pH. After the pH, you see in which direction your bicarbonates and CO2 have moved. Then once uh, they, uh, once there is a uh, distribution on either side, body always try to compensate because we always want to have a normal pH or a normal physiology for better functioning of our cellular level. So compensation is always going in opposite to the primary disorder. It may be adequate, it may be inadequate, that we have to do, uh, that we have to calculate. When compensation is not adequate, then you call a second disorder because it has prevented your pH, uh, your physiology to reach the normal limits. So caveat in the assessment of compensation is that pH is generally not brought to the normal range in acute disorders. So if patient has a short history, your pH is normal, that means your compensation is uh, uh, overacting and that means there is a second disorder also present. So a normal pH in an acute disorder is a, uh, signifies a coexistent second disorder which is working in the opposite direction. So one is increasing the pH, other is decreasing the pH, they have come down to a normal level. Also remember, there will never be an overcompensation, even in chronic conditions. So no amount of compensation in a chronic respiratory acidosis can make a pH alkalotic. If it is, over, uh, if it is uh, alkalotic in a patient with CO2 disorder, that means there is a second disorder. So it is never overcompensated, and uh, if there is an acute disorder, the pH is in normal range, you move to the second disorder. So when there is a metabolic alkalosis, that means your bicarbonate are rising, so your PCO2 will again rise to compensate for the increase in bicarbonate. It is calculated by bicarbonate plus 15. Again in metabolic acidosis, it is added, added to 15. When coming to respiratory conditions, you have acute and chronic. So a short formula is 1, 3, 4, 5. Otherwise you can calculate using this formula. So respiratory acidosis, uh, if it is acute, bicarbonate will increase by 1 for every 10 increase in uh, CO2. If it is chronic, bicarbonate will uh, increase by 2 to 3, above 40 mm of Hg. If it is alkalosis, again fall will be by 2 or 4 to 5. In metabolic, the compensation is similar to first two digits of decimal in pH. It works in most of the conditions. After evaluating your uh, pH, your uh, bike, uh, direction, which is the primary disorder, which is your secondary disorder, then we move what is your compensation, adequate, inadequate. In step 6, we move to the anion gap. Normal range of anion gap is 8 to 12. We have two types of anion gap disorders. One are normal anion gap disorders, other are high anion gap disorders. It is calculated by sodium minus sum of chloride plus bicarbonate. Then if you have a high anion gap disorder, you try to calculate the delta gap, which is change in the anion gap minus change in the bicarbonate. It is normal within uh, 0 to 6, plus minus 6. So delta gap more than 6 comprise there is a second disorder which is an additional metabolic alkalosis apart from high anion gap metabolic acidosis. If it is less than minus 6, it means patient has both high anion gap metabolic acidosis as well as normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Then when you have a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, you always calculate a urinary anion gap. In high anion gap, you calculate the delta gap and in normal anion gap, you calculate the urine anion gap by measuring the urine sodium plus potassium minus chloride. So a positive urine anion gap say, tells you about distal renal tubular disorders, which is uh, type 2, type 4 RTA. And negative urine anion gap tells you about type 2 RTA, patient has diarrhea, renal glucosuria, or hyperuricemia. So if a patient has not even give you a history of diabetes, and if you are getting a normal anion gap with a negative urinary anion gap, you can go back and again ask patient whether you have any history of diabetes or not. For oxygen abnormalities, the uh, term which we calculate is the alveolar arterial gradient because it tells you about the origin of respiratory disorder, whether it is a central disorder or it's a lung which is primarily involved. So alveolar arterial gradient is calculated by uh, arterial gradient we get in the ABG, alveolar gradient is calculated using a formula. At sea level it is, remains very simple, 150 minus PSU2 upon 0.8. If it is less than 10, the cause is hypoventilation without an underlying pulmonary disease. So patient may even have hypoxia with normal lungs, normal x-ray, normal CT, normal PFT. Everything is normal, yet patient has a oxygenation disorder. So it's a central hypoventilation. But when difference is more than 10, then it remains the underlying pulmonary disorder, ventilation, perfusion, mismatch, or both. 
So uh, there is a case, a 73-year-old female who underwent coronary artery bypass graft in 2016. Uh, she currently presented with fracture femur, admitted for surgery. <coughs> Post-surgery, she received two units of uh, blood in ward, following which she became again breathless, and you got a call in pulmonary reference, and she was shifted to ICU. On examination, patient was cooperative, oriented, pulse rate, uh, tachycardia, hypertension, she is hypoxic, saturation is 86 at room air, urine output has fallen, and on auscultation, she has bilateral crepts. X-ray you have got uh, was done in the emergency itself. It shows pulmonary edema. Echo in your ICU shows ejection fraction of 35%. Other lab parameters, hemoglobin has fallen. That's why she was transfused. Uh, TLC is slightly raised. Platelets are in normal range. Urea creatinine are slightly deranged. And then you get the ABG report. So uh, if uh, when we evaluate ABG, first thing is we have to see at what oxygen level it was done. Whether the ABG is of room air or whether the ABG was done at any FiO2 of 1 liter, 2 liter, 3 liters on NRBM or on ventilator at any FiO2. And then we start the calculation. So going by this step, first we evaluate the history. Patient has old age, patient has CAD, and current issue are post-op conditions. So before evaluating your ABG, now you have to think, okay, patient has a heart disease, so I have to look for those parameters in ABG. Patient is a post-operative case. So perioperative things we have to moderate how much fluids have to, has to be given to the patient, how many blood transfusions were given. So we validate the ABG. ABG was validated. And pH is seven, less than 7.36. So there is acidemia. And then we look at the bicarbonate in CO2. The bicarbonate has fallen. So it is in the same direction as pH. So primary disorder is metabolic acidosis. Then we calculate the compensation of PCO2. It came out to be between 38 to 42. However, your patient has a pH of uh, PCO2 of 46. So it is above the calculated range, hence there is associated respiratory disorder. So when there is a metabolic acidosis, you have to always calculate an anion gap, whether it is a high anion gap or a normal anion gap. So we calculated the anion gap. Patient's anion gap came out to be normal, which is less than 12. So it is a case of normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. When you calculate the respiratory acidosis uh, or any respiratory evaluation, you always calculate the AA gradient and AA gradient is again more than expected for the age. So patient has a presence of hypoventilation with intrinsic lung disease. Your final ABG report remains non-anion gap metabolic acidosis and a respiratory acidosis. Now you have to evaluate what are the causes of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis in my patient and what are the causes of respiratory acidosis in my patient. So normal anion gap metabolic acidosis is again explained by renal failure. Your urea was rising, your creat was rising. Respiratory acidosis, again in view of pulmonary edema, patient may have bronchial wall edema, which may cause airway trapping, and patient may land into a respiratory acidosis. Again, what additional information can be derived from the case history and investigation? The presence of anemia, because patient had a hemoglobin of 8.8. .8. This will affect your oxygen delivery to the tissues and due to decreased carrying capacity. So now your ODC curve, the oxygen dissociation curve, need to be read in the form of acidemia. So when you have acidemia for the same level of PO2, your SpO2 is lower. So that is why your patient was hypoxic by ABG and had an SpO2 of 86%. Uh, so that is why implying a pH and then seeing the SpO2 is very important. So another case, a uh, 67-year-old female, she presented to emergency with history of fever and chills in last two days and sudden onset breathlessness for past one day. So now with your uh, history, we know disease is acute. Patient does not have any chronic comorbidity. So now you will start thinking in terms of acute disorders. Conscious oriented, again, tachypnic, tachycardic, room air saturation was 90. Lab values had high TLC, blood glucose was again very high, 443. Urea creat were normal. X-ray shows pneumonia in the right side. pH was 7.28, PCO2 was 32, PO2 was 56. So short duration of symptoms suggest acute illness. ABG is validated. pH is suggestive of acidemia. Bicarbonate is low. It is a metabolic disorder. The secondary compensation by CO2 should be 30 to 32. So observe PCO2 is within the range. So the secondary compensatory response is adequate. When there is a metabolic acidosis, you calculate the anion gap. Here, the anion gap was more than 12, so you calculate it as high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So for high anion gap metabolic acidosis, glucosuria is one of the causes, and you uh, did the urine ketones, and they were positive. 
So when there is a high anion gap, you calculate the delta gap, and delta gap came out to be minus six in this case. It is that means only the high anion gap metabolic disorder is existing, and there is no non-normal anion gap disorder with it or any metabolic alkalosis with this. So probable etiology for the above derangement, the high anion gap is due to diabetic ketoacidosis, and by investigation you have proven also patient has a urine ketones positive acidemia that is good enough to diagnose a diabetic ketoacidosis. So this was all about uh, arterial blood gas analysis. Uh, arterial blood gas analysis basically requires your practice with pen and paper. It cannot be done on hands, it cannot be done with the calculators. It always has to be with hands. So the backside of the ABG report is always a blank slide. So you can always write the entire report on the backside of the report. We have a practice in our ICU from our times that we write the whole ABG report on the ABG itself so that any next person in or during over also, it is helpful to them for understanding. Uh, going to the part two of the talk, uh, again, when you see a PFT, uh, what, is you what you require is to use the, utilize the blank empty space at the bottom of the PFT report to write the report. ABGs <coughs> and uh, again for the interest of the audience here Dr. Nitesh can you just put it in a nutshell when you have the steps again uh, like what are all the steps you will see starting from the clinical scenario so that people who have come newly will also understand. So whenever we have an ABG it starts always with a clinical history you should know your patient before reading the ABG. Even when the referral comes to you from the emergency department or from the say, surgery ward or from the CTVS ICU or from any ICU, say, you should always read the history first. What is the case? That will help you in interpreting your ABGs because you need to know acute or chronic. Second step is to whether my ABG is right or wrong. There is no point in interpreting a wrong ABG. So you should always validate using the chart. What is the pH? First thing which you see in an ABG because you have to find acid or base. So less than 7.36 acidemia, 44 is alkalemia. Once you know the pH, you need to see what is causing this pH. A respiratory disorder or a metabolic disorder, which is again, uh, then you evaluate your bicarbonate and CO2, seeing their direction. Once you find what is the pH, what is the disorder, whether there is any compensation present or absent. If compensation is there, whether it is adequate or inadequate, there will never be an overcompensation. So using compensation formulas, we should always keep them in handy. We should always have a screenshot or maybe a copy or in displayed in your ICU. What are the compensation formulas? Once the compensation formulas are there, you calculate the anion gap, see whether they are normal or high. Once they are high, you calculate the delta gap. Once they are normal, you calculate the urinary gap. And in the end, you write the entire presentation for the uh, acidemia, alkalemia part. Apart from that, you also evaluate the ventilation part, which is again done by the oxygenation parameters of alveolar arterial gradient. Using your P alveolar uh, gas equation, it has to be calculated, and arterial uh, PO2 is always given, it, given to you. The K weight in this is this FiO2 pattern. If you see this FiO2, so suppose if you are doing an ABG interpretation at 50% FiO2, you cannot use this C level. Uh, PaO2 values, you have to use, you have to start from here. Say FiO2 is 1, pressure is 760 minus 47 minus what is my PCO2 upon 0.8. That will be your correct alveolar O2 and not your, uh, this thing, uh, not the 150 minus PCO2 upon 0.8 because this is done at sea level and at room air. The other thing which is there is when you go to the ABG, there is always a parameter here where you enter the FiO2. Say FiO2 in this report is 29%. And alveolar arterial gradient is calculated in this ABG report. Now suppose your patient is at FiO2 of 0.5, but the technician has forgot to enter your FiO2. It, will, it is uh, by default 21%. So this alveolar arterial gradient will be wrongly calculated. You need to enter the right FiO2 if you want the automatic calculation of alveolar arterial gradient. So the basic point of putting this presentation is, because in a busy practice, what we generally see is we see ABG, we just see the pH and we see the PCO2 and we think uh, our job as a clinician is over. It is not like that. You can make extraordinary diagnosis just by looking into your ABG. So as Dr. Nitesh has already put into it, the first and the foremost thing for people here to understand is you need to see all the parameters, starting from the name. 
in your busy practice what will happen is your abg will not contain the name so they may interchange your abg these are the practical difficulties which you will see in a routine practice second thing is you have to see the fio2 the four important parameters which you have to see is ph pco2 po2 and the bicarbonate level and if you feel that you are having a component of metabolic acidosis then you should also make sure you calculate the anion gap for all cases until and unless you make it a part of a routine first few days you will find it it is very difficult because you have to see so many parameters once it becomes a part of your reflex all that it takes is just 30 seconds and you won't believe like when we were trained by our professor jc suri we used to make multiple diagnoses just looking at the abg for example, a patient comes to you of a COPD who comes to you in respiratory arrest, CO2 is high. All that you will think is patient has an acute exacerbation of COPD. But it might not be the case only. The patient can have even a uh, patient can have a central hypoventilation or patient can have an aspiration which has led the patient to develop a secondary hypoventilation. So many such parameters can be picked up if you are very strong with your ABG. So the entire crux of this lecture is ABG, you should go stepwise. You should not hurry just looking into the pH, saying that the patient is having uh, hypercapnic respiratory failure or not. You need to look into all this, and coexisting diseases are also common. You can have a respiratory acidosis along with a metabolic acidosis also. For example, patient comes to you in DKA. Patient is comatose. He will, you are expected to have only metabolic acidosis. But what happens when a patient goes into comatose condition, he is not going to breathe. So he will also have a coexistent respiratory acidosis. So you should always do the compensation and see. Because once you know that you have multiple uh, problems, that is when your clinical equipment inc increases and you treat the patient appropriately. I think uh, yep. that is what Dr. Nitesh wanted to put it from this. So basically after this talk, the more you will use pen and paper for an ABG report, it is a very good tool to impress your colleagues, I'm telling you. Even your critical care colleagues, your medicine colleagues, it is a very good tool because when we go in our ICUs, uh, in other ICUs when referral come, we go and talk about on ABG only for 15 minutes. And we tell them the diagnosis from ABG because we were well trained for uh, this thing. So it's always a good practice, it's hard to do. We were blessed that every ra our round used to begin only with an ABG and ends with an ABG. So we, were, uh, we developed a very good practice using this parameter only. So moving on to PFT, it is like a bread and butter for a pulmonologist and uh, for any evaluation of a respiratory disease. So when a patient comes with you with a chest pain, what is the first thing you do? You send him for an, after your history and BP measurement, you send him for an ECG. Can anybody tell me the diagnosis? There are so many residents here. Just by looking at the ECG. A single line diagnosis. Don't make it with pen and paper, just speak. So you, so ST elevation and MI. See, just by looking at, without looking into any other parameter, you were able to tell the report. So that's how a pulmonologist tells, just by looking at the uh, PFT also, what is the patient ever diagnosis. But if you go into a step-by-step -step evaluation of an ECG, you have to mention all these points while reporting an ECG. Rate, rhythm, axis, P waves, QRS, ST, PR interval, Q waves, QRS interval, T waves, U waves, lead 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1 to V6. But we are so used to see the ECGs so uh, frequently and so closely that just by looking at the spectrum, you were able to tell, sir, he has ST wall MI, please shift him uh, for a thrombolysis immediately. And patient gets treatment in maximum 15 minutes. So why doesn't the same happens with a PFT? So pulmonary function tests are basically a spectrum of tests. It's not a single test. You have spirometry, you have bronchodilator response, you have lung volumes, you have resistance, conductance, using a body box, you have DLCO, you have impulse oscillometry, you have six minute walk test and arterial blood gas. So whenever there's a long question in your exams on pulmonary function test, you have to mention some or the other thing about all these points. Otherwise you will just feel key if lung volumes, uh, they have just asked lung volumes, I have mentioned, but I have not got marks. So actually pulmonary function tests involve these. So spirometry, spiro means air, metry means how do you measure. It was introduced about uh, almost 180 years back by Sir John Hutchinson in 1846. And for 100 years till 1940s, vital capacity was the only measured function. There was no other function which was measured. Why it is called a vital capacity, there's an interesting history behind, behind it. Uh, Sir John Hutchinson worked on the many of the TB patients. And when he found why TB patients don't survive, he found that this capacity of their lungs was less as compared to the 
healthy adults who lived longer than them. That's why this was named as a vital capacity and this was the only thing which was measured. It is only after 1940s that FEV1 and FEV.6, SVC and all other parameters started getting, the, uh, getting into the limelight. So before sending your patient to a spirometry, always see whether there is a contraindication of spirometry. With ECG, there is no contraindication. But except for a burns patient, that how do you get it from front or from back? But in a contraindication of spirometry, please, it's a very simple investigation. Your patient should not land up in your ICU because from OPD he went for a spirometry. So whenever there is an increase in myocardial demand or changes in BP, like acute MI within last week, this is a very common practice. Patient had an MI, he has dyspnea, your cardiologist has referred to a pulmonologist, no patient dyspnea is not getting relieved. You send it, okay, dyspnea, you get a spirometry done and your patient collapses in your spirometry lab. So always history has to be first seen. Patient has a severe hypertension, patient has a hypotension, patient has any history of significant arrhythmias, patient has a non-compensated heart failure, patient has uncontrolled pulmonary hypertension, patient has an acute core pulmonale, clinically unstable pulmonary embolism, or patient has history of syncope related to forced expression of cuff. It doesn't mean patient has come with dyspnea and cuff, you inquired, patient also says, after two minutes of coughing, I used to fell in bathroom, when I squared, I just fell in bathroom and you're sending him for PFT. Patient has any cerebral aneurysm, any brain surgery within last four week, any cataract surgery within last one week. This is also again a very common thing. Patient has got cataract operated, being referred to you post-operative for a dyspnea evaluation. Patient is a third trimester pregnancy, patient has history of pneumothorax, patient has thoracic surgery in last four weeks, any abdominal surgery in last four weeks. Pregnant females develop dyspnea during the third trimester and they are referred to you for evaluation and you send them for PFT. Please do not do it and again, Always see whether your patient is suspected TB or not. If your patient is suspected TB, please rule out TB first or rule in TB first rather than getting a spirometry. And condition which predispose to transmission like history of hemoptysis, patient has significant secretions, like patient is a bronchiectasis, comes in acute exacerbation with copious amount of sputum. It, you, do, you are not meant to do a PFT in those patients. So when you do a spirometry, we'll be just discussing about the spirometry. Uh, there are two types of graphs. Uh, there's a volume time graph and there's a flow volume graph. We are, we are trained and actually we have the habit just to see the volume, flow volume graphs, because, flow volume loops, because we get the diagnosis through that. But volume time graph, I feel is a more important thing than the flow volume graph. We'll be going through it, why do I feel it is more important? And before doing anything, you must always see your axis, whether they are right oriented or not. For a volume time graph, the x axis one box is compared to the two axis on the y, and for your flow volume loop, your x-axis 0.5 is compared to 1. If these are not the set parameters in your uh, graph, in your machine, your, even for a normal patient, you will get a wrong graph. So always, like for ECG, you are used to see ECG at 25 mm speed. We are not used to see ECG at 50 or ECG at 10. So if we do give you an ECG at 50, you will still interpret it as in the format of 25 only. So again, this. ECG and spirometry are almost same. Both have multiple parameters and require a equal clinical practice to interpret them correctly. So these are the acceptability, usability, and repeatability criteria. We'll not be going through in much detail it is because this is a more of a theoretical thing. I'll be showing you through practical examples what is acceptable, what is usable, and what is repeatable. So what a most important thing is, first, do not go jump to the values see the graphs first. Okay, so when you have cuff in first second, so if I just see my flow volume graph, I'll be surprised, I cannot see any time. So can I tell where is the first second of cuff in this? As, per, as shown in graph, it is somewhere here, the cuff is somewhere here, but if you see the volume time graph, you can see before first second, patient, there is a fall in pressure, and patient has cuff. This graph, this report is not acceptable. Please do not interpret. Just because patient has done an effort and uh, the patient cannot do it again, you do not interpret the report because it is going to be wrong. Again, if the cuff is after first second, say in this terminal portion, or in, if you see in the volume time graph, your first second is crossed and cuff is somewhere here. It is acceptable and you can further report it. Glottic closures. Many of the times while expiring, patient just close the glottis. He stops expiring. What happens is you are expiring, 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 and suddenly there is a sharp drop in flow. So if you see 
a sharp drop in flow, just like your ventilator, you do not interpret it. Patient has caused a glottic closure. And when you see the volume time graph, instead of going up, that is more and more volume should come out as time has passed out, your volume time graph falls flat. That is, there is no flow. This is, uh, so this is again not interpretable because entire volume has not come out. Maybe you may get an FE1, but you will not get the FEC, right? Again, your ratios will get disturbed. So when you have leak, again, this is the expected graph, but your graph has fallen early. So a leak and glottic closure. Then you have a lot of errors. FIVC more than FVC. So if you see this inspiratory loop, it is here, and when you have expired, you have started expiring from here. So patient has taken tidal volume, tidal volume, tidal volume. Patient has inspired. Patient has completely expired. And then you ask one complete expiration. Your FIVC is more than FVC, uh, which is, again, not acceptable. When you see these serrations throughout the expiratory flow, that means something is obstructing, obstructing through the flow. There is a valve mechanism. Patient is expiring, stopping, expiring, stopping. So this is, again, not acceptable. If you do not get a peak, this is, again, not acceptable. So do not interpret these reports. Do not read their generated reports. They are of no value in the clinical diagnosis of the patient. And as new ERS guidelines now state, PFT diagnosis is separate from clinical diagnosis. PFT is a physiological parameter, it just tells you the physiology. It does not tell you the diagnosis. It is just telling you a physiology. Your diagnosis is again by clinical with PFT with other parameters. So this is a most common thing uh, which we see with the handheld spirometers which you do, which we do in OPDs, especially with uh, a lot of companies offering that uh, we'll set up a PFT lab. If you do not have a PFT, we'll get the PFT done through the technician. What has happened here? Can anybody identify? So we want you to answer because there is also an award for uh, someone who is the most interactive. The most interactive resident today gets a stethoscope. So keep answering. Even if you don't know, just keep answering. There is nothing to lose. You will gain only. So that is why here comes the importance of volume time graph. If you see, after two seconds, there is no volume. There is no flow. Only for two seconds, patient has expired and there is no flow. So when you interpret this report, because your first second has crossed, so you will get a good FEV1, but your FVC value will fall. It is 3.81. So this is very common in office spirometers. So it is that's why it is important to see a volume time graph, whether my patient has expired for six seconds or not. If he had <coughs> expired for anything less than six seconds, please do not interpret, repeat the test. because. Here, what will happen is your FVC is reduced. You will think patient has a restrictive lung disorder. You will get a CT. You will get a further evaluation. In the, to begin with, your patient was absolutely normal. He did not perform the spirometry in a normal way. Then this is something zero flow offset. If your tidal volume graphs keep move, moving either on the right side or on the left side, this, orange, uh, this red one is the first one, then blue is the second, then third, then fourth, then fifth. Similar, red is the first one, third, fourth, fifth. Do not interpret this report. The zeroing of the machine is not set properly. So what reference equation do you use when you sit up in a setup? A lot of people come to you, sir, this is my machine. Please buy it uh, or please use it. You should always use the reference standard which are adhered to your population. You cannot use a Caucasian population equation in the Indian patients. Now, a lot of Indian equations have come up, even for North India, South India, East and West. So you ask the origin of the patient in which part of the country you were born, and then you choose that reference equation for interpretation. So interpretation of spirometry begins with, if you see FE1, FVC ratio, if ratio is normal or ratio is reduced. This is, of course, after you have seen whether my graphs are acceptable or my report is acceptable. So FE1, FVC ratio is normal, you see the FVC. If FVC is reduced, you see a possible restriction. If FVC is normal, it is a normal spirometry. So just by three parameters, FE1, FVC, and FVC, whether you have a normal spirometry or you have a possible restriction. So if you go to this scenario, your FE1, FVC ratio was normal, but your FVC was reduced. 
So you may think that patient has a possible restriction. Despite patient did not perform the test properly, that's why you had a reduced FPC. If your ratio is reduced, you again look at the FVC. If FVC is also reduced, patient has a mixed disorder. If FVC is normal and only ratio is reduced, patient has airflow obstruction. In cases of possible restriction or in where FVC is reduced, you need lung volumes to further report your patient. I think, Nitesh, uh, everyone needs to understand that this is the most important slide. If you want to interpret a PFT, a spirometry report, this is the slide that you need to remember. So if there are any doubts, please keep asking them. Please don't feel shy. Don't, don't feel it's a silly question. Please stop us, ask questions. Right? So has any, everyone understood this slide? Right? This is the most that important That is why slide. we have written in red and blue, otherwise, so that you understand it either ways, whether you understand with fifth percentile or you understand the normal and abnormal. So again, we are again looking at it. If F1 FVC ratio is less, it is an obstruction. If it is ratio is more, it is there is no obstruction. But again, if your FVC is reduced, there may be suggestive of restriction. So case one, uh, this is one of the very interesting PFTs which we have done uh, actually yesterday only. So this was a patient who came to us, and his uh, uh, graph was done. The dark line is your predicted what is what is as per age sex height and ethnicity and your dot is one is the spirometry values which have come in the report so if we see we saw that predicted values have come so this is the actual this is what machine gives you that this is a normal range for the patient this is the normal value for this age uh, sex height weight and ethnicity these are the five parameters on which these values are decided when they fed into your reference equation these are the values this is the column which you see, that is predicted. That is what patient is getting. So when we uh, did all this, the values were coming in negative. So we were surprised to see, patient was, uh, patient just complains of dyspnea for three months, that too on exertion. So when we saw these values as negative, and percentage predicted was going again in a negative range. We went back and we saw the height and weight. The height was 76 centimeter and weight was 185 kgs. So that's a, and, you see, and when we see a patient, patient was more than six feet tall. So height and weight was wrongly entered by your technician. So always see these parameters first. What was, were these parameters enter, entered in a right way or wrong way? This is what will happen if your height and weight get, gets exchanged. Your predicted values will go into a negative range. So always check the preliminary examination before jumping into the interpretation of the report. Like always for any report, you check whether this is of this patient only, any hemogram report, any x-ray report, any CT report. But in PFT, we always have a habit of not seeing the first column and jumping onto the, straight away onto the reports. So this was the test when height and weight were corrected. So now you see the predicted values have also come in a right way. So again, the the measurement is always check the preliminary in information. So case two is a spirometry. So here we see it is starting from a zero. It is having a good peak and it is ending in a good way without simply falling it down. So interpretation remains normal ventilatory function. This is how a normal spirometry loop should look like. So going to case three, a 24 year old man presents to you with dyspnea and cuff for four years. Dyspnea is associated with wheezing, a seasonal variation, and remissions. Patient is a non-smoker, no occupational exposure, associated with upper respiratory tract symptoms. Examination revealed prolonged expiration. And this was the PFT report. So can anybody interpret it? Any volunteer? So any of the residents. What was the first step that he has said? You need to look at the graphs first. Don't jump to the values, look at the graphs. So look at the graphs, what are they telling you? So above the x-axis is the expiratory limb. Below the x-axis is the inspiratory limb. For most of the diagnosis, we look at the expiratory limb. Look at the shape of the expiratory limb. What is it telling you? There is some amount of coving going on there. Yes, does that give you a hint? First things first, look at the history of the patient. What was the history of the patient? This was a young person with seasonal variation of breathlessness. The patient had a wheeze 
features of ATOP. Look at the PFT, look at the expiratory curve. The expiratory curve is showing you a coving over there, right? So before even you go to the values, can you make a differential diagnosis? Can you think of something? What pattern is this? I would request the audience to raise their hands because people who are participating more might get a stethoscope. So if you really want a stethoscope, you have to raise your hands and give the answer. What is the current answer? You could, yeah. Yes, please answer. You could identify a ST elevation MI. Please answer. Very good. So this is an obstructive pattern. This is what the coving is telling you. This is an obstructive pattern. So even if you don't look at the values, the graph is going to give you a lot of information. Now the second step is to go to the values. Now who can interpret the values for us here? He's told you there are three values that you need to look at, the FEV1 to FVC ratio, the FVC and the FEV1 values. Anyone, this interpretation is very easy. We already know it is going to be an obstructive pattern. So what values are there? It's very easy, FV do it. FEV1 by FVC ratio is decreased, sir. Ratio. So what is the ratio like? That is the first thing that you will see. Decreased, sir. Yes, so predicted is 80. For the patient, it is 68. 68. So it is decreased. So if the ratio is decreased, what kind of a pattern are we hinting at? Obstructive. It pattern. is going to be an obstructive pattern. So what is the next thing that you will look at? FVC, sir. Okay, so you can see the FVC value. What is the FVC there? The FVC value is also decreased, but to make a diagnosis of obstruction, it is the FEV1 FV values that we are more interested in. So the FEV1 predicted FV1 value is 3.39 3 3 for the patient, 9, it is 2.18, 2 so, so it is decreased. It is decreased. So this is an obstructive ventilatory defect. But what is very important here, Nitesh, what is the other post-bronchodilator telling us? Change you can tell them. Change in FEV1 is 30%. So, so what is that? Bronchodilator reversibility is present. So this. So we can make a diagnosis of bronchial asthma. No, you will still not make a diagnosis of bronchial asthma. A spirometry is going to tell you a pattern. pattern. This is suggestive of bronchial asthma. You are not going to make a diagnosis of bronchial asthma based on a PFT. Asthma is a clinical diagnosis. Yes. yes. Based on the clinical history, you can say this is bronchial asthma. But what this curve is telling you is that this is a obstructive, obstructive ventilatory pattern. defect, and there is bronchodilator, bronchodilator reversibility yes, present, right? So Nitesh, how do we comment on the bronchodilator reversibility here? So bronchodilator reversibility is change in volumes plus change in percentage. So previously it used to be 12% and 400 ml. Newer guidelines say you calculate the change, it is of more than 10% uh, between the predicted and the observed, and you call it a bronchodilator reversibility. The more important thing in the graph is you see the black dots, you see the lines, you see three different patterns here. So the black dot is your predicted thing. That is what should be for this patient, age, height, weight, race, sex, and ethnicity. So this is the black dot. Immediately on seeing the graph, on seeing uh, the graph that whatever other graphs are there, they are below that black dotted line. That means there is reduced reduction in the volumes, reduction in the uh, flow. If your line, if your graph is going above the line, then uh, you see whether it's a supranormal pattern or not. Otherwise, once you see it is not following those dotted lines, it is very clear that there is some abnormality in the graph. To what degree, for that you need the values. So again, but just by looking at the graphs, you see there is a difference between the two graphs. That means the reversibility is present. Nitesh, if we can have a restrictive case and wind it up. Because. Okay. So a 63-year-old female presents with progressive dyspnea and exertion over past one year. A dry cough, no wheeze, no sputum, no fever hemoptysis. Examination, she has tachypnea, clubbing, and bilateral velcro crepts. Saturation at room air showed 91%. This was the x-ray, a dirty lung picture. Cardiac borders are not very well defined. And you get a CT done, you see an uh, interlobular thickening pattern. So in your mind, it is now a restrictive disorder by your clinical and radiological picture. You get a PFT done. You, again, uh, you see the dotted lines are there. These are the predicted pattern. And you see the patient's pattern is way below the predicted pattern. That means there is a abnormality present and you see the ratio is normal the ratio is normal but your FVC is reduced to 37 percent so when your ratio is normal your FVC is reduced it suggests you it suggests you a possibility of a restriction to confirm you need lung volumes to be done so summary 
First things first, avoid using the machine interpretation. You do not interpret the ECG by the report written on the ECG. So do not interpret the PFT by the report written on the PFT. Always examine the clinical data and other investigations which patient has got. First examine the PFT for quality control and a suspected disease pattern based on your clinical history. Always consider the pre-test probability of the disease. What my pre-test probability is high. Select appropriate local equations. Carry out three comparisons with the normal values obtained from predicted equation from the known pattern of for the disease pattern and previous tests of the patient. And then advise on further testing. Do not just advise on further testing your PFT is normal, your uh, X-ray is normal, your CT is normal, get a lung volume done. So please do not do that. Have a pre-test probability of what you are thinking. Thank you.